Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Salem's Lot. Specifically, this is assignment number 10. I'm going to read for about 20, 25 minutes. You're going to answer as many questions as you can from assignment number 10. And your homework would be, of course, to finish assignment number 10, answering all 20 questions. Um, as usual, I'm going to say this again. I'm very serious about this. This book um, is very mature. It's probably the most mature book you've ever read. Um, and what I mean that by that is um, the content. It's, it's just over the top mature. The language is very raw, the, 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 the vocabulary, what they say, what they do. So again, this is not meant for children or younger brothers or sisters to even listen to it for a little while. Make sure you get them out of the way. If they're there and they can't be got out of the way, put earphones in if you are listening. I just put it out there that I always make sure my daughters, 11, 10 years old, are not anywhere near when I'm reading this book. because it's just not for young ears. Um, when they get 16, 17, they, I always want to know, of course, because they, I get them out of here. They're always like, well, what is it? Why can't I listen? Um, and I've told them both that they can read this or listen to me teaching it when they're 16. And I'm standing by that. Um, so please um, get little kids out of there. Okay, let's go. Let's enjoy it. Um, assignment number 10 for Salem's Lot. Um, specifically, I am in part two, The Emperor of Ice Cream, uh, chapter 10, The Lot 3, part four. So again, we are in part two, The Emperor of Ice Cream, chapter 10, The Lot 3, and this is part four. Okay. My God, don't you look good, Ben said. Against the hospital world of solid whites and anemic green, Susan Norton looked very good indeed. She was wearing a bright yellow blouse with black vertical stripes and a blue short denim skirt. You too, she said, and crossed the room to him. He kissed her deeply, and his hand slid to the warm curve of her hip and rubbed. Hey, she said, breaking the kiss. They kick you out for that. Not me. No, me. They looked at each other. I love you, Ben. I love you too. If I could jump in with you right now, just a second, let me pull back the spread. How would I explain it to those little candy stripers? Tell them you're giving me the bedpan. She shook her head, smiling, and pulled up a chair. A lot has happened in town, Ben. He sobered. Like what? She hesitated. Hardly know how to tell you, or what I believe myself. I'm mixed up, to say the least. Well, spill it and let me sort it out. What's your condition, Ben? Mending, not serious. Matt's doctor, a guy named Cody? No, your mind. How much of this Count Dracula stuff do you believe? Oh, that. Matt told you everything. Matt's here in the hospital, one floor up in intensive care. What? He was up on his elbows. What's the matter with him? Heart attack. Heart attack? Dr. Cody says his condition is stable. He's listed as serious, but that's mandatory for the first 48 hours. I was there when it happened. Tell me everything you remember, Susan. The pleasure had gone out of his face. It was watchful, intent, fine drawn. Lost in the white room and the white sheets and the white hospital, Johnny, he again struck her as a man drawn to a taut, perhaps fraying edge. You didn't answer my question, Ben. About how I took Matt's story? Yes. Let me answer you by saying what you think. You think the Martian house has buggered my brain to the point where I'm seeing bats in my own belfry, to coin a phrase. Is that a fair estimate? Yes, I suppose that's it. But I never thought about it in such such harsh terms. I know that, Susan. Let me trace the progression of my thoughts for you if I can. It may me do me some it may do me some good to sort them out. I can tell from your own face that something has knocked you back a couple of steps. Is that right? Yes. But I don't believe I can't. Stop a minute. The word can't blocks up everything. That's where I was stuck. That absolute goddamn imperative word can't. I didn't believe in that, Susan, because such things can't be true. But I couldn't find a hole in the story any way I looked at it. The most obvious conclusion was that he had jumped the track somewhere, right? Yes. Did he seem crazy to you? No. No, but. Stop. He held up his hand. You're thinking can't thought, aren't you? I suppose I am, she said. He didn't seem crazy or rational to me either. And we both know that paranoid fantasies or persecution complexes don't just appear overnight. They grow over a period of time. I need careful water and care and feeding. Have you ever heard any talk in town about Matt having a screw loose? Ever heard Matt say that someone had the knife out for him? Has he ever been involved with any dubious causes, fluoridation causes, brain cancer, or sons of the American Patriots or the NLF? Has he ever expressed an inordinate amount of interest in things such as substances or astral projection or reincarnation? Ever been arrested that you know of? No, she said. No to everything. But then, it hurts me to say this about Matt, even to suggest it, but some people go crazy very quietly. They go crazy inside. I don't think so, he said quietly. There are signs. Sometimes you can't read them before, but you can afterward. If you were on a jury, would you believe Matt's testimony about a car crash? Yes. Would you believe him if he had told you he saw a prowler kill Mike Ryerson? Yes, I guess I would. 
but not this. Ben, I just can't. There, you said it again. He saw her ready to protest and held up a forestalling hand. I'm not arguing his case, Susan. I'm only laying out my own train of thought, okay? Okay, go on. My second thought was that somebody set him up. Somebody with bad blood or a grudge. Yeah, that occurred to me. Matt says he has no enemies. I believe him. Everybody has enemies. Third degree. Don't forget the most important thing. There's a dead man wrapped up in this mess. If someone was out to get Matt, then someone must have murdered Mike Ryerson to do it. Why? Because the whole song and dance doesn't make much sense without a body. And yet, according to Matt's story, he met Mike purely by chance. No one led him to Dell's last Thursday night. There was no anonymous call, no note, no nothing. The coincidence of the meeting was enough to rule out a setup. What does that leave for rational explanations? That Matt dreamed the sounds of the wind going up, the laugh, the sucking sounds. That Mike died of some natural cause, natural but unknown causes. You don't believe that either. I don't believe that he dreamed hearing the window go up. It was open, and the outside screen was lying on the lawn. I noticed it, and Parkins Gillespie noticed it, and I noticed something else. Matt has latch-type screens on his house. They lock on the outside, not the inside. You can't get them off from the out inside unless you pry them off with a screwdriver or a paint scraper. Even then, it would be tough. It would leave marks. I didn't see any marks. And there's another thing. The ground below that window was relatively soft. If you wanted to take off a second floor screen, you'd need to use a ladder and that would leave marks. There weren't any. That's what bothers me the most. A second floor screen removed from the outside and no ladder marks beneath. They looked at each other somber. He resumed. Running through my head this morning. The more I thought about it, the better Matt's story looked. So I took a chance. I took the can away for a while. Now tell me what happened at Matt's last night. If it will knock all this into a cocked hat, no one is going to be happier than I. It doesn't, she said unhappily. It makes it worse. He had just finished telling me about Mike Ryerson. He said he heard someone upstairs. He was scared, but he went. She folded her hands in her laps and was now holding them tightly as if they might fly away. Nothing else happened for a little while. And then Matt called out, something like he was revoking his invitation. Then, well, I don't really know how to. Go on. Don't agonize over it. I think someone, someone else, made a kind of hissing noise. There was a bump as if something had fallen. She looked at him bleakly. And then I heard a voice say, I will see you sleep like the dead, teacher. That's word for word. And when I went in later to get a blanket from Matt, I found this. She took the ring out of her blouse pocket and dropped it into his hand. And turned it over and tilted it toward the window to let light pick out the initials. MCR. Mike Ryerson? Mike Corey Ryerson. I dropped it and then made myself pick it up again. I thought you or Matt would want to see it. You keep it. I don't want it back. It makes you feel bad. Very bad. She raised her head defiantly. But all rational thought goes against this, Ben. I'd rather believe that Matt somehow murdered Mike Ryerson and invented that crazy vampire story for reasons of his own. Rigged the screen to fall off. Did a ventriloquist act in that guest room while I was downstairs? Uh, planted Mike's ring? And gave himself a heart attack to make it all seem more real, Ben said dryly. I haven't given up hope of rational explanations, Susan. I'm hoping for one, almost praying for one. Monsters in the movies are sort of fun, but the thought of them actually prowling through the night isn't fun at all. I'll even grant you that the screen could have been rigged. A simple rope sling anchored on the roof would do the trick. Let's go further. Matt is something of a scholar. I suppose there are poisons that would cause the symptoms that Mike had, maybe undetectable poisons. Of course, the idea of poison is a little hard to believe because Mike ate so little. You only have Matt's word for that, she pointed out. He wouldn't lie because he would know that an examination of the victim's stomach is an important part of any autopsy, and a hypo would leave tracks. But for the sake of argument, let's say it could be done, and a man like Matt could surely take something that would fake a heart attack. But where is the motive? She shook her head helplessly. Even granting some motive we don't suspect, why would he go to such Byzantine lengths or invent such a wild cover story? I suppose Ellery Queen could explain it somehow, but life isn't an Ellery Queen plot. But this... This other is lunacy, Ben. Yes, like Hiroshima. Will you stop doing that? She whip cracked at him suddenly. Don't go playing the phony intellectual. It doesn't fit you. We're talking about wives' tales, bad dreams, psychosis, anything you want to call it. That shit, he said. Make connections. The world is coming down around our ears, and you're sticking at a few vampires? Salem's lot is my town, she said stubbornly. If something is happening here, it's real, not philosophy. I couldn't agree with you more, he said, and touched the bandage on his head with a rueful finger. And your ex packs a hell of a right. I'm sorry, that's the side of Floyd I never saw. I can't understand it. Where is he now? In the town drunk tank. Parkin Gillespie told my mom he should turn him over to the county, to Sheriff uh, McCaslin, that is, but he thought he'd wait and see if he wanted to prefer charges. Do you have any feelings in the matter? None whatever, she said steadily. He's out of my life. I'm not going to. She raised her eyebrows. But I want to talk to him. About us? about why he came at me wearing overcoat, hat, sunglasses, and Playtex rubber gloves. What? 
Well, he said, looking at her, the sun was out. It was shining him, and I don't think he liked that. They looked at each other wordlessly. There seemed to be nothing else on the subject to say. Five. When Nally brought Floyd his breakfast from the excellent cafe, Floyd was fast asleep. It seemed to Nally that it would be a meanness to wake him up just to eat a couple of Pauline Dickens hard fried eggs and five or six pieces of greasy bacon. So Nally disposed of it himself in the office and drank the coffee too. Pauline did make nice coffee. You could say that for her. But when he brought in Floyd's lunch and Floyd was still sleeping and still in the same position, Nally got, Nally got a little scared and set the tray on the floor and went over and banged on the bars with a spoon. Hey, Floyd, wake up. I got you dinner. Floyd didn't wake up, and now he took his key ring out of his pocket to open the drunk tank door. He paused just before inserting the key. Last week's gun smoke had been about a hard guy who pretended to be sick until he jumped the turnkey. Now he had never thought of Floyd Tibbetts as a particularly hard guy, but he hadn't exactly rocked that but he hadn't exactly rocked that Mears guy to sleep. He paused indecisively, holding the spoon in one hand and the key ring in the other. A big man whose open throat, white shirts, always sweat stained around the armpits by noon of a warm day. He was a league bowler with an average of 151 and a weekend bar hopper with a list of Portland red light bars and motels in his wallet right behind his Lutheran ministry pocket calendar. He was a friendly man, a natural fall guy, slow of reaction and also slow to anger. For all these not inconsiderable advantages, he was not particularly agile on his mental feet and for several minutes he stood wondering how to proceed, beating on the bars with the spoon, hailing Floyd, wishing he would move or snore or do something. He was just thinking he better call Parkins on the citizens' band and get instructions when Parkins himself said from the office doorway, What in hell are you doing, Nolly? Calling the hogs? Nolly blushed. Floyd won't move, Park. I'm afraid that maybe he's, you know, sick. Well, do you think beating the bars with that goddamn spoon will make him better? Parkins stepped by him and unlocked the cell. Floyd? He shook his shoulder. Are you all right? Floyd fell off the chained bunk and onto the floor. God damn, said Nolly. He's dead, ain't he? But Barkins might not have heard. He was staring down at Floyd's uncannily reposeful face. The fact slowly dawned on Nally that Parkins looked as if someone had scared the bejesus out of him. What's the matter, Park? Nothing, Parkins said. Just, let's get out of here. And then almost to himself, he added, Christ, I wish I hadn't touched him. Nally looked down at Floyd's body with dawning horror. Wake up, Parkins said. We've got to get the doctor down here. Six. It was mid-afternoon when Franklin Bodden and Virgil Rathbun drove up to the slatted wooden gate at the end of Burns Road 4, two miles beyond Harmony Hill Cemetery. They were in Franklin's 57 Chevy pickup, a vehicle that had been Corinthian ivory back in the first year of Ike's second term, but which was now a mixture of shit brown and primer paint red. The, black of the, the back of the truck was filled with what Franklin called crappy. Once every month or so, he and Virgil took a load of crappy to the dump, and a great deal of said crappy consisted of empty beer bottles, empty beer cans, empty half kegs, empty wine bottles, and empty pop-off vodka bottles. Closed, Franklin Bodden said, squinting to read the sign nailed to the gate. Well, I'll be dipped in shit. He took a honk off the bottle of Dawson's that had been resting comfortably against the bulge of his crotch and wiped his mouth with his arm. This is Saturday, ain't it? Sure is, Virgil Rathbun said. Virgil had no idea if it was Saturday or Tuesday. He was so drunk, he wasn't even sure what month it was. Dump ain't closed on Saturday, is it? Franklin asked. There was only one sign, but he was seeing three. He squinted again. All three signs said closed. The paint was barn red and had undoubtedly come out of the can of paint that rested inside the door of Dud Rogers' caretaker shack. Never was closed on Saturday, Virgil said. He swung his bottle of beer toward his face, missed his mouth, and poured a blurt of beer on his left shoulder. God, that hits the spot. Closed, Franklin said with mounting irritation. That son of a whore is off on a toot, that's what. I'll close him. He threw the truck into first gear and popped the clutch. Beer foamed out of the bottle between his legs and ran over his pants. Winder, Franklin, Virgil cried, and let a massive belch as the pickup crashed through the gate, knocking it onto the can-littered verge of the road. Franklin shifted him to second and shot up the rutted chuck hole road. The truck bounced madly on its worn springs. Bottles fell off the back end and smashed. Seagulls took to the air in screaming, circling waves. A quarter of a mile beyond the gate, the Burns Road Fork, now known as the Dump Road, ended in a widening clearing that was the dump. The close-pressing alders and maples gave way to reveal a great flat area of raw earth which had been scored and runnelled by the constant use of the old case bulldozer which was now parked by Dud Shack. Beyond this flat area was the gravel pit where current dumping went on. The trash and garbage glitter shot with bottles and aluminum cans stretched away in gigant gigantic dunes. Goddamn no account, hunchback pisswa. Looks like he ain't plowed nor burned all the week long, Franklin said. He jammed both feet on the brake pedal, which sank all the way to the floor with a mechanical scream. After a while, the truck stopped. He's laid up with the case, that's what. I never knew Dud to drink much, Virgil said, tossing his empty out the window and pulling another from the brown bag on the floor. He opened it on the door latch, and the beer, crazy up from the bumps, bubbled out over his hand. 
All them hunchbacks do, Franklin said wisely. He spat out the window, discovered it was closed, and, <laughs> and swiped his shirt sleeves across the scratched and cloudy glass. We'll go, we'll go see him. Might be something in it. He backed the truck around in a huge wandering circle and pulled up with the tailgate hanging over the latest accumulation of the lots of accumulated throwaway. He switched off the ignition and silence pressed in on them suddenly. Except for the restless calling of the gulps, it was complete. Ain't it quiet, Virgil muttered. They got out of the truck and went around to the back. Franklin unhooked the S bolts that held the tailgate and let it drop with the crash. The gulls that had been feeding at the far end of the dump rose in the cloud, squalling and scolding. The two of them climbed up without a word and began heaving the crappy off the end. Green plastic bags spun through the clear air and smashed open as they hit it. It was an old job for them. They were part of the town that few tourists ever saw or cared to. Firstly, because the town ignored them by tacit agreement, and secondly, because they had developed their own protective coloration. If you met Franklin's pickup on the road, you forgot it the instant it was gone from your rearview mirror. If you happened to see their shack with its tin chimney sending out a pencil line of smoke into the white November sky, you overlooked it. If you met Virgil coming out of the Cumberland Green front with a bottle of welfare vodka and a brown bag, you said hi and then couldn't quite remember who it was you had spoken to. The face was familiar, but the name just slipped your mind. Franklin's brother was Derek Bodden, father of Richie, lately deposed king of Stanley Street Elementary School, and Derek had nearly forgotten that Franklin was still alive and in town. He had progressed beyond black sheepdom. He was totally gray. Now, with the truck empty, Franklin kicked out a last can, clink, and hitched up his green work pants. Let's go see Dud, he said. He climbed down from the truck, and Virgil tripped over one of his own rawhide laces and sat down hard. Christ, they don't make these things half right, he muttered obscurely. They walked across to Dud's tar paper shack. The door was closed. Dud, Franklin bawled. Hey, Dud Rogers! He thumped the door once, and the whole shack trembled. A small hook and eye lock on the inside of the door snapped off, and the door tottered open. The shack was empty but filled with a sickish sweet odor that made them look at each other and grimace. And they were barroom and they were barroom veterans of a great many fungoid smells. It reminded Franklin fleetingly of pickles that had laid in a dark crock for many years, until the fluid seeping out of them had turned white. Son of a whore, Virgil said. Worse than gangrene. Yet the shack was astringently neat. Dud's extra shirt was hung on a hook over the bed, the splintery kitchen chair was pushed up to the table, and the cot was made up army style. The can of red paint with fresh drips down the sides was placed on a fold of newspaper behind the door. I'm about to puke if we don't get out of here, Virgil said. His face had gone a whitish green. Franklin, who felt no better, backed out and shut the door. They survived the dump, which was as deserted and sterile as the mountains of the moon. He ain't here, Franklin said. He's back in the woods someplace, laying up snookered. Frank? What? Franklin said shortly. He was out of temper. That door was latched on the inside. If he ain't there, how'd he get out? Startled, Frank turned around and regarded the shack. Through the window, he started to say and then didn't. The window was nothing but a square cut into the tar paper and buttoned up with all-weather plastic. The window wasn't large enough for Dud to squirm through, not with a hump on his back. Never mind, Franklin said gruffly. If you don't want to share, fuck him. Let's get out of here. They walked back to the truck, and Franklin felt something seeping through the protective membrane of drunkenness, something he would not remember later or want to creeping feeling, a feeling that something here had gone terribly awry. It was as if the dump had gained a heartbeat, and that, that beat was slow yet full of terrible vitality. He suddenly wanted to go away very quickly. I don't see any rats, Virgil said suddenly, and there was none to be seen, only the gulls. Franklin tried to remember a time when he had brought the crappy to the dump and seen no rats. He couldn't, and he didn't like that either. He must have put out poison bait, huh, Frank? Come on, let's go, Franklin said. Let's get the hell out of here. Seven. After supper, they let Ben go up and see Matt Burr. It was a short visit. Matt was sleeping. The Oxygen tent had been taken away, however, and the head nurse told Ben that Matt would almost certainly be awake tomorrow morning and be able to see visitors for a short time. Ben thought his face looked drawn and cruelly aged for the first, for the first time an old man's face. Lying still with the loosened flesh of his neck rising out of the hospital, Johnny, he seemed vulnerable and defenseless. It's all true, Ben thought. These people are doing you no favors, Matt. If it's all true, then we're in the citadel of unbelief, where nightmares are dispatched with Lysol and scalpels and chemotherapy rather than with stakes and Bibles and wild mountain time. They're happy with their life support units and hypos and then enema bags filled with barium solution. If the column of truth has a hole in it, they neither know nor care. He walked to the head of the bed and turned Matt's head with gentle fingers. There were no marks on the skin of his neck. The flesh was blameless. He hesitated a moment longer, then went to the closet and opened it. Matt's clothes hung there, and hooked over the closet door's inside knob was the crucifix he had been wearing when Susan visited him. It hung from a filigree chain that, seemed, that gleamed softly in the room's subdued light. Ben took it back to the bed and put it around Matt's neck. Here, what are you doing? A nurse had come in with a pitcher of water and a bedpan with a 
out curiously over the opening. I'm putting his cross around his neck, Ben said. Is he a Catholic? He is now, Ben said somberly. All right, that's a good place for me to stop. Um, we are now in part eight of the same place. So part two, the emperor of ice cream, chapter 10, the lot three, but you're going to go down to eight. So we read four, five, six, and seven in this little part of assignment number 10. So again, I will say this, you are going to pick it up in part two, the emperor of ice cream, chapter 10, the lot three, part eight. Enjoy the rest of assignment number 10, everybody. I'm looking at this part right now, and I think this might be one of those uh, little crazy spots. Um, Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, this is uh, this next part that you're going to read is definitely one of those parts that I was talking about that you don't want little kids to read, um, that it's more of a mature audience. You definitely want to put a mature Kenny mature rating on this in NC 16 or 17. Um, but enjoy it. It's, a, it's a, the rest of this book, I believe, from this point on, it's just all action, um, which is a lot like Dracula in that regard. Remember, the first part of Dracula was the exposition where we met all the characters and we learned about everything and everybody, what they were doing, where they were, why they were there, why they were going to do it. And then the second part of the book was Dracula going around and killing people, you know, your Lucy and the, the, the kids, the blue for lady, and then getting Nina. And then the third part of the book was the hunt for Dracula. You're going to see that Stephen King does very similar breakdown in this book. First part, the first third of this book was basically, you know, it was about the lot. It was about all the different people and the characters. The second part of the book, the emperor of ice cream is the part where the lot starts to fall apart, right? Because we now know what's happening. People are being turned. The vampires are loose. And then the third, part, I'm not going to say what it is, but is it going to be just like Dracula? And that would be the chase for Count Dracula. In this case, it would be the chase for Straker and Barlow. But let's wait and see. I don't want to tell you what it is, but considering he's uh, Stephen King has followed the format for the first two parts, it's probable that he will follow it for the third part. Um, but we'll wait and see. Have a lovely day, everybody. Please finish assignment number 10. Enjoy it. Remember, you have to answer 20 questions. Have a good one.